this morning reminded me what uh, you may not always observe it and think about how beautiful it is, but wow, I've had a chance to, uh, to live in five different countries and lived outside the U.S. for the last 15 years or so, and what a, what a beautiful place it is, Utah and, and Cache Valley. Um, so to make sure that, I've, uh, that I kind of meet some expectations as, as you would like to do it, um, so what, uh, ha what year are you in school? Seniors in school, okay, and, and, and it's an entrepreneurial type focus in, in the class. Some of you, I suspect, are already out doing some fun and exciting stuff. Uh, what I'm going to try to do, and I'm, I'm hoping this is going to work for me, I should have, uh, um, could you maybe just bring up on the internet prezi.com, P-R-E-Z-I.com, and I'll see if I can pull up some, some thoughts I can share with you. So in a nutshell, I've spent 23 years with Procter & Gamble, um, worked in five different countries and six different businesses. So it was quite a ride, and I'd love to share with you a little bit about that. But I have happened in the last year or so to be associated with just a fascinating little opportunity. I've been teaching at the University of Utah and then working with small entrepreneurs, uh, consulting them and helping them out. And as of uh, January, I invested in a small company uh, last February called Orbrush. Has anyone heard of Orbrush? Raise your hands if you had, it'll make me feel good, okay? Do any of you have an ore brush? Okay, good, all right, that's good. Well, I, I brought you one today, so you can know what it is. Well, ore brush is a tongue cleaner, okay? An ore brush has the small understated goal to be the number one tongue cleaner in the world and help cure the world of bad breath, okay? And it started out in Springville, Utah. The gentleman who was supposed to be here, and I'm subbing for him, is uh, Bob Wagstaff. Bob Wagstaff graduated from the University of, of uh, or from Utah State University. Fascinating guy, 76-year-old guy. Developed the tongue cleaner um, back in uh, almost a decade ago. He was a he was a mission president for the LDS Church in the Philippines, and the missionaries were offending some of the people they were talking to because they had bad breath. And so Bob, as a PhD, a biochemist, and he began to experiment with and look at and found out that 90% of, uh, of bad breath comes from what? Bacteria on your tongue. And so he created this little device called, called Aura Brush. And let me see if I can pull this up quick. I can't remember the password. Sorry for a minute here. So, so Bob created this, uh, this tongue cleaner, and you've probably heard, you've heard one of these stories before, surely. In fact, how many of you, by the way, have ever used Prezi technology? It's cool, isn't it? Really a cool, cool uh, technology. I, I have trouble sometimes with it, but uh, all right, now I want to just go for a minute. All right, so, so to start off here, so this will give you a little bit more of the story of Aura Brush. I'm Dr. Bob. I'm Dr. Bob. I invented Aura Brush. It was first 
tried to sell it at an infomercial, which was not successful at all. We then tried to sell it in the retail, and nobody had any interest in it. Kind of in a last ditch effort, he takes it to a local university here, and they do a marketing class. And it says to them, listen, we just don't know how to market the thing. And so they took it, and a group of students did uh, market research on the tongue brush market. And they came back and they said, well, we looked at the online market to see if you'd sell this on the internet. We found that 92% of people wouldn't really be interested in buying something like this online. So you probably just better not bother. But one student raised his hand in the class and said, well, that means that 8% of people that's Jeff Harmon, I'll tell you. That's Austin. I'll tell you in a minute about them. And Dr. Bob really liked the sound of that. So he connected with the student after class. This marketing student decided to do a YouTube video. The whole video cost just a few hundred dollars, which I thought was really expensive. We had kind of a basic outline of what we wanted, but a lot of it we were just shooting from the hip, making it up as we go along. So far as I was concerned, I thought that was going to kind of be the end of the story. But I kept going to work, and my coworkers would, would update me on the view count for our video. Say, hey, your video that you did for the, for the ore brush, the tongue brush, it's got like 5,000 views. And I was like, oh, 5,000 views. Pretty cool, 5,000 views. Your video's got 10,000, your video's got 20,000, 50,000, your video has 100,000 views. Last I counted, our channel, we had over 16 million channel views. As a result of that, we started getting inquiries from everywhere, from over 40 countries of companies or individuals who want to be our distributors. I think what YouTube has done is it, kind of level the playing field, where Dr. Bob had tried a whole bunch of different things because he was just a guy with an invention. He couldn't get it in front of very many eyes. You know, stores wouldn't listen to him because he wasn't a major company, and people had never heard of it before, so they weren't that interested. But when we took it to YouTube, that changed everything. It just got bigger and bigger and bigger. I think YouTube enables normal people, just people like us, like Dr. Bob, and like a couple college kids, to take an idea and put it in front of everybody really get an honest response. We could play on the same terms as these huge companies. And when that happens, it just changed the way we could work at all. You know, it changed the, it changed the scope of our dreams there. So the story of Warbrush is actually from a strategic and from a business evolution standpoint, in my humble opinion, I think it's going to be a case study. Hopefully I'll write it. Maybe four or five years from today you guys might be studying it. Let me tell you why. There's a guy, how many of you have heard of the book The World is Flat by Friedman? If, by the way, as entrepreneurs, if you haven't read it, you should read it, okay? Friedman's The World is Flat. I had a chance as a Procter & Gamble general manager five years ago when he launched that book. He came to Cincinnati, Ohio. They brought in all the general managers from around the globe, and we heard him give his insights from this book. He has ten flatteners. flatteners and, and these flatteners were um, reasons why he believed the game was going to be changed globally in how business was transacted. And what I can tell you is that Having run global businesses the last five years, um, I was uh, my, my most recent assignment in Procter & Gamble, I was responsible for the professional hair business. Now, I know what you're all laughing at, okay? The bald guy that ran the professional hair business. But what I always warn people is that in my youth, I used a lot of competitive products, okay? So you, you want to make sure you use good Procter & Gamble products on your hair. Um, in this assignment, I spent a ton of time in Asia. And I spent a lot of time, by the way, in Brazil. And I spent a lot of time in Moscow and in Russia and in St. Petersburg. The developing markets, they call them BRIC. Have you heard of BRIC before? Brazil, Russia, India, China. Brazil, Russia, India, China are going to be game-changing for entrepreneurs and major corporations. Um, why are they going to be game-changing? Why do you think? What's the big deal? Population. population. It's a numbers game. In business, it's a numbers game. As an entrepreneur, if you don't know who your target audience is and who's going to buy your product, you're not going to be successful. So everyone is scrambling now, realizing that places like Russia, India, China, Brazil, I've been to all four places several times in the last five years. What's happening in those marketplaces? Huge populations. What's the other thing that's happening? Low labor wages. Low labor wages. Excellent. 
increasing disposable income was the thing I was looking for. Okay? When I arrived in Slovakia in 1992, the average wage for a Slovak was about $700 per year. You thought I was going to say per month, right? It's per year. Okay? Now today, if you just look at Slovakia or Eastern Europe, those disposable income levels are, you know, it's 10 times. However, by the way, the population, guess what's happening in those places? Russia particularly. Russia at an even more extreme rate than the United States. What is, the, what is capitalism traditionally critiqued for? What? What do you think? What's good and what's bad about capitalism? What do you think? Exploitation, Exploitation right? Rich get, rich. rich get richer, poor get poorer. Listen to the Democrats, the Republicans in the U.S., and that's the discussion, right? Um, what's happening in Russia and other places, India as well, by the way, China as well, frankly, Brazil as well as I think about it. So actually in all of those places, there, you're seeing this segmentation of the population by the haves and the haves nots and what's happening in places particularly like um, China and Russia is you have an incredible filthy wealth wealth by the way way beyond even the US do you know by the way what city has the most billionaires per capita than any other city in the world Moscow okay ironically isn't it communist the, the great evil empire has more capitalists in it than, than anywhere in the world. Um, so what you have is you have this incredible changing market going on. So you buy my argument that the demand globally is shifting and changing. You used to be able to build a market in the US and you'd be fine. And by the way, you can still do that. But if you really want to go for what you should as an entrepreneur, the one question I get asked a lot is, you know, why do you guys in Logan, Utah, at Utah State University, or at the University of Utah, or BYU, or anyone here, or anyone in the domestic U.S., why do you think it's important that you understand what's going on around the globe? Is it that important? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think that uh, you're exactly right. And at the end of the presentation on Ourobrush, you'll, you'll get it. It's a case study, okay? Little Bob Wagstaff, just a fascinating guy. I hope you get the chance. He gets the chance to come back here. Um, in Springville, never anticipated what has just happened in a year and a half, and I'm telling you, we're going to be a global retail uh, consumer products company in the next three or four years. He never anticipated that, but the marketplace al is allowing for it. Back to my point, the world is flat. I call what we have done in Ourobrush the reverse marketing model that leverages the engagement loop with consumers. Now, what do I mean by that? 23 years at Procter & Gamble, they taught me a traditional way to go to market with products. You normally had an idea, you built a prototype, you went and did a test market, you then scaled your manufacturing for supply, you went into retailers, and then you turned on your, what? Well, no. The, <laughs> The, the deep, how, how do you find out about my product today? Marketing. Then you turn on the marketing, right? You get distribution. You turn on the marketing. And I try and convince you to buy my product. If my product's good, uh, you, you then buy it a second time, which is what some entrepreneurs don't figure out. Just getting someone to buy your product the first time is not a business model. That's a one-time cash flow event. Getting someone to buy your product the second time and the third time and the fourth time, that's a business model. That's a sustainable business model. So as we take a look at this, I want to spin you through the Orbrush story. And then I want to come back and I'll open it up for some discussions. I want to talk to you about the product, the marketing, and the growing category. Now what you'll see from the reverse marketing model, so I told you the traditional model they taught me at P&G. By the way, p and is not unsuccessful with that model. Um, major $80 billion corporation, 150 countries been around for 170 years, uh, not a bad model, but the reverse model, the Ourobrush model is, we went out and got, we turned on marketing first, went out and got awareness about our product with target consumers, and now we are now going, and we have this amazing level of awareness and trial online, and we're now trying to go reverse to retailers, 
and get distribution retailers. You get it? The reverse marketing model? It's, uh, it, and it's something that uh, I think is quite a phenomenon going on. So first I want to talk to you a little bit about the, about the product. So we, are, we believe we're in the evolution of oral care. Started out with toothbrushes, toothpaste, uh, mouth rinses, floss, most recently teeth whitening. How many of you had your teeth whitened before? In, right? If I'd asked that question three, four years ago, how many, how many hands do you think would have gone up? Probably zero. Okay? So teeth whitening has added a lot of incremental revenue to the oral, oral hygiene market. We think that the next big opportunity actually is tongue cleaning. Okay? You're laughing. You shouldn't laugh, I'm telling you. We're going we're to create a new category of tongue cleaning. Now, I think, I'm on my, I think Bob and his new team are on their way. Let me explain it to you. So there's a scientific case for this. I just explained it. Most of your bad breath, 90% of it comes from bacteria on the tongue. What do we do to, to, to mask that stinky breath? We use about $3 billion of gum or mints or other things to mask the problem, um, w as I just mentioned there. Now, um, this tongue cleaner thing, it's not like we're the first one. In fact, by the way, there's some incredible cultural history that, uh, that you may know about. India, actually, has been tongue cleaning for about 2,000 years. And it was fascinating for, for me when I was over there. They, in, in India, uh, they actually do more tongue cleaning on the broad population than they do teeth cleaning. Um, and and it's, a, it's, a, it's a wire thing, and they, they scrape it off the tongue. And there are incredible health benefits to ensuring that you, have that you don't have bacteria on the tongue. The problem is this small little category hasn't been marketed very well. Products are average or, or less than average, and we have now want to blow that up and change that. If you take a look at the tongue, that black stuff in the middle, unfortunately, is what most of you do have on your tongue, unless you're using an oar brush. Okay? So that is bacteria. And the problem with, you say, hey, Jeff, we brush, I use my toothbrush. The problem is, is that a toothbrush has a tufted bristle meant for the flat surfaces of your teeth. Now, do you think that's going to get down into the pores of your tongue? And by the way, even if it does, which sometimes you do, you dislodge the bacteria. What happens to the bacteria if you dislodge it and don't remove it? Anyone know about bacteria? What does bacteria do? Multiplies. So you actually, three or four hours later, are in a worse position than if you maybe didn't do it. Okay? Um, so anyway, you see Bob's invention over there. It's soft bristles. See the bristles. Do you know what a surgeon uses to scrub their hands? That's what the bristles are. So those bristles up there, and if you see one, I actually think I have one, so I'll pass one around here for you. And if you're really nice to me, I think we're going to give you one. Um, yeah, so here's one. Take one down that. So you see the bristles, and then at the end of it, it's got a, it's got a scraper. So the bristles get down into the soft, porous, porous parts of the tongue. You kind of rake it, get the bacteria out of there, and then you scrape it off. It's kind of gross. You'll see it in here in a minute. And the, the tongue scraper out there today, all entrepreneurs, number one rule of entrepreneurship, in my opinion, by the way, same thing for a big company. What do you need to know before you launch your product? Competition. Competition. What is the competitive offering out there? What's the pricing? What's the positioning? What's the marketing spend? What's the proprietary position? What do I mean by proprietary position? Is there a, like, intellectual property? Do you have intellectual property? Do you have patents? Okay. I wouldn't have gotten involved with Orbush, by the way. I invested in it. I wouldn't have gotten involved. We happen to have a patented device. It's FDA approved. So I know that not easily can someone come in and steal my idea as I'm now spending lots of money to go market and create awareness about the product, right? Now I'll, I'll pass that one. Pass that one. Now, let's talk for a minute. So it gives you a little bit of overview on the product, okay, what we're selling. Let me tell you the fascinating story about Orient Brush. It relates to the marketing. Now, this first video you're going to see, Bob and Austin in the, in the opening video talked about it. The start of Aura Brush happened with this video. Palatophobia, the irrational fear of bad breath. 
I'm a coward to go. I'm not so much afraid of me having bad breath. I'm afraid of other people having bad breath. As in, hey buddy, your breath smells like crap. Maybe you should develop a case of halophobia. Now I know what you're asking. How do we know we have bad breath? You use this. You use a spoon. Now I know what you're thinking. A spoon. You eat with a spoon. You play spoons. You spoon your girlfriend. You take the spoon. <laughs> Take the spoon and you stick it at the back of your tongue and gently scrape. Let it dry. We'll take a whiff. If it stinks, your breath stinks. And if your breath stinks, this is the only kind of spooning you're going to be getting. The smart viewer on there will know. If you check your bad breath, you notice that we checked our tongue. 90% of bad breath comes from bacteria and residue on the tongue. On your tongue. Now, your mom doesn't sound so stupid for telling you to brush your tongue. Now, does she? Tongues are like sponges, soaking up all that bacteria. Toothbrushes are meant to clean the smooth surfaces of your teeth, not your tongue. And the tongue scraper? You remember the sponge, right? The tongue scraper just goes over the top of your tongue. This ain't gonna work. And mouthwash? This is like trying to clean your carpet with a hose. You're just watering down the problem. And then there's the option that actually works. <coughs> this, the Aura Brush. The soft bristles feel great on your tongue. You just go back and forth a few times, then go all the way back, pull it forward, and see what comes off. It's the cure of bad breath. You can use this longer than your toothbrush. Use it in the morning, eliminate morning breath, fresh breath all day, and then use it at night, right before bed. So do you and me and the rest of mankind a favor? Get one. And your Uncle Steve, the one who looks like he's got a thick coat of fur on his tongue? Get him one to put it in his Christmas stocking. He'll thank you for it later. His wife will, the kids will, everybody will be happy to trust him. Get your first Aura Brush free at AuraBrush.com slash free. Okay, so, I mean, is that that special, do you think? Oh, it's not bad, right? Funny? It's, it's interesting? Uh, that YouTube video has 13.5 million views right now. And I'll tell you the other part of the story, which is amazing. They shot that, as you heard in the story, they shot it for 200 bucks, which, which Bob thought was quite a bit of money at the time. They shot it in a pool hall. If you listen really closely to this original YouTube version, you can hear pool, uh, pool balls. Pool balls, is that the right thing to say? Cue balls, cue balls, whatever those are. You can hear them kind of clanging in the background. Um, now, what is unique about this advertising medium, potentially, as to why we may have been successful so far? What is it that you, is unique about this YouTube execution? This is your generation, by the way. This is, this, is, this is what I'm learning. I'm feeling like I'm drinking from a fire hose to understand this. Tell me. I can make things are worldwide in the second of on the internet. Perfect. Okay. Excellent. Did everyone get that? You're worldwide. You're worldwide in English, which, you know, again, but by the way, when you see, we're, we're, uh, we, we get views from all over the globe. English happens, by the way, to be the world business language. So you, you get automatically global. Remember back to my question, do you need to worry about being a global guy? Well, I think, that, well, I'll come to that. Excellent. Worldwide. What's the other thing unique about this medium? The Internet. It's, YouTube videos aren't forced on people. We'll search them out. Excellent. What's your name? Jeremy. Jeremy. Okay, excellent. I spent most of my career, who, do, you know, do you know who the number one world advertiser on television in the world is? Procter and, Procter and Gamble. We spend more money on TV advertising than anyone else in the world. We're spending, by the way, a lot less lately. Mm -hmm. um, we're mixing things up now. There's a huge difference between what Jeremy just said on a television impression and a internet YouTube impression. Say, most of you on TV, if I'm right, have a little thing called a DVR. You spin right through, you tape your shows, you spin right through all the commercials, right? By the way, there's really interesting data that even spinning through the commercials, you get about 80% of the messaging. Interesting, huh? Think about it, it makes sense. Because as you're zipping through it, you actually, especially for your generation, you know, that just wants, wants information and, and stuff fast, you still get it. So TV is not dead. This TV is definitely not dead. Lots of other places are dead. Newspapers are dead. Um, magazines, a lot of magazines are dead. But TV will, will continue. There'll be less TV and more internet, but, but it's not something you want to walk away from. But on the internet, I'm sitting down, I'm clicking on something, and I'm deciding how long I'm going to watch it. 
fascinating story with Google Analytics, or fascinating story with Google Ad Analytics, I can actually know how long you watched my video. And the fascinating thing, that's a two minute and 15 second video, and 90% of the 13 plus million that watched it, watched it past two minutes. Fascinating, okay? They're opting to be in. Now, what all of you are hopefully gonna do for me, even after this wonderful presentation, is you're gonna become subscribers to our channel. That's the other thing you could do. At the end of watching it, you can say, hey, that was pretty funny. I'm gonna to subscribe to that channel. What are you doing when you subscribe to a YouTube channel? You're opting in to be what? Marketed to. Okay, what's good? You should know. That's why I'm here today. You should know. Because you're opting in to be marketed to. And it's a fascinating part of why a YouTube impression is so much better than a TV impression. Which one costs the most today? By a long, long way. How many of you believe that will continue? That model is absolutely right now in conflict. Okay? We, we talk about the story. I'm not sure Bob and Jeffrey, the, 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 the BYU student, was the guy who raised his hand and said, hey, 8% of the U.S. is about a $24 million market. Why would we not start out an internet and, and run this thing off the internet? Um, we talk about this. We couldn't actually start up Ourobrush today the way we did just a year and a half ago. Why? The rates on YouTube have gone up. So we would have to, you know, to bootstrap it the way they did a year and a half ago, they couldn't have done it. They wouldn't have had the money. They wouldn't have, would have needed angel money earlier or, or seed money earlier. So that's how fast the game's changing was the point I wanted to make there. Now, with that video, our strategy at Orbrush on the reverse marketing model is we're not going to skip any steps. We're just doing it differently. This is the power of marrying up the the, uh, the, the uh, millennial generation with, uh, with my generation. So I know how you market. They know how to pick up the right people on the right media or medium. And we're marrying that up and we're just doing it in a different order. So if you take a look at this, we're, we're absolutely doing now what I call online to offline. We're taking our awareness on, from online and we're now gonna go to offline and we build it right into our model. Okay, we build it right into, you can see we're in London Drugs. You can figure out exactly where we want to go there. Here's our YouTube page. Do you remember when the, in the video how many views he said he had? 16 million? 35 million. Actually, I got on, on, online last night, and I think it was 36 million already. And th this, this, uh, this presentation was prepared for me a week and a half ago. You take a look at this down here. Number five, most subscribed all-time sponsor on YouTube. Guess where we are today? Actually, so it has to be a little older. It's probably two or three weeks old. We're the number two all-time sponsor on YouTube. We just passed. Do you know who was number three? Apple. Do you know who was number four? Disney. Do you know who was number five? We. And have you ever played that small game called We? Do you know who's number one? Old Spice. Have you ever seen the Old Spice commercial? Yeah. Okay. Old Spice has about 190,000, almost 200,000 subscribers. Little Orbrush, Springville, Utah, has 117,000 subscribers. We were down in Google last, last week. We have a strategic relationship with Google. Why would Google be interested to talk with Little Orbrush? Because we, Jeremy, are pioneering a model that potentially could change the game. How many of you uh, as entrepreneurs or have ever read TechCrunch out of the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, okay? TechCrunch, go on there and check it out. They wrote an incredible article on us. We were down there two weeks ago. We interviewed with them. They wrote an incredible article that was picked up by the Wall Street Journal, uh, ABC Nightline, uh, uh, picked it up. What she said is we're either little ore brush is either potentially a game-changing model or an internet phenomenon. Either way, by the way, I think it's a pretty good business model. Okay, so but but you read her article. It's a fascinating fascinating article about what she said and what she talked about. Um, so anyway, this is this is again, this is our medium. We are not doing anything else. We're not doing billboards. We're not doing radio. We're not doing TV. We're not doing newspaper. We are picking up people. Um, our target audience is is. Uh, men and women between the ages of 15 and 25 
who are cult-like about their oral hygiene. That's our target audience, okay? And, uh, and by the way, we happen to have a lot of people buying outside of that target, but that target is really buying, okay? They're buying online, and we're now trying to connect them at retail. So if you take a look here, here's the stat that is flabbergasting if you really take a look at it. This is the discussion on TV and the internet. Exceeds 2 billion views a day, is nearly double the primetime audience of all three major US broad broadcast networks combined. 24 hours of video uploaded every minute. Your new business model to communicate and market and get awareness will have to have a video component, my friends. It's where the target audience is. My son is 16 years old. My, my second son is 16 years old, Cole. He doesn't watch television. And when he watches television, it's on the internet. It's off his laptop. I don't get it. Right? We got this nice big theater room. And I go in his room and he's watching, you know, the office on his Mac. And I don't get it. I, I'm sorry, I don't get it. But I know I got to market to it. Right? I've got to really figure that out. So this is a very, very important trans transformation and change that's going on. Um, as you take a look at that, Facebook, by the way, 33% of the US population is on Facebook every day, OK? Changing dynamics if you're going to figure out how you're going to market to people. Now, we talked about the internet. So P&G launched this campaign at the Super Bowl last year. They did pretty well, by the way, even with spending all those buku bucks. They launched it at the internet uh, on TV. Then they came back later in August of last year, July and August of last year, and they launched it, the YouTube campaign. The YouTube campaign, by the way, which was more successful? Yeah, so, so what, what they told us actually was. Nielsen is reporting that sales for Old Spice body wash as a whole rose by 55% over the last three months. And just this past month, sales saw a boost of 107%. Wow. So individual products that were slipping. 107% versus the 50%. So the TV lift wasn't bad, but 107% on top of the 50%. Massive growth. One of the classic things about this campaign is even more important. Um, those of us that maybe have a little less hair in the room will remember the brand positioning of Old Spice as very different than what the new positioning of it. My son thinks Old Spice body wash is cool. He buys it. Right? It actually had a much older different demographic target when that brand, that brand's a very old brand at Procter & Gamble. So in less than a couple of years, they've transformed the whole positioning of the brand, and they did it again with the YouTube execution. Here's what we talk about, you know. So here's P&G. Happen to know a little bit about that small company. They have about 133 million views. Today, by the way, that's almost 180 million. And... Uh, Orbrush, if you take a look at little Orbrush that barely has distribution today, has only created a, a very large online presence, we have 26% of the total views of Old Spice, an iconic brand that's been in distribution around the globe and is, uh, you know, has got uh, incredible, I mean, it's, it's a, uh, I'm trying to think here, it's a four, three or four hundred million dollar brand, okay? So quite interesting. <laughs>
that I can program, is that like JavaScript, like a program? <laughs> What's this? And what are you doing? What, what? Are you like snapping at me? <laughs> to the chase. I've got sheer entrepreneurial spirit, and that's why you should make me a permanent part of your organization. But you don't cut hair. <laughs> you stink. Well, I've done some freelance work, some acting, some modeling. Nothing moved. Um, I've done some commercials on YouTube for Warm Brush. Oh, when I was a kid, I used to uh, help clean dog wounds. You might have something for you in the mailroom. Oh, really? In the mailroom, huh? Like, oh, this big tongue's going to lick all our stamps and envelopes? Maybe you should work in the filing room because you're a pro filer. Pro filer. Get out of here. No, you make me sick. Get out of you here. You make me sick. I'm, just, I'm taking this. Can you believe that guy? Oh, go work in the bathroom. You must be good at licking stamps and envelopes. I am good at licking stamps and envelopes. But it's not because I'm a tar. It's just I happen to excel at licking stamps and envelopes. In short, what's your dream job? And if you don't have a job, what do you do in your free time? My dream job would be to get paid for what I do in my free time. Head of the class. Anybody want to pay me for that? And don't forget to prescribe to my channel. Check out these Awesome vids every Tuesday. The party! Y'all come back now, you hear? So, if you're going to pick up the audience, the target audience, where you're trying to find them, how often do you think, even though that one original video has been seen 13 million times, how many times do you think you're going to go on and watch that thing again? Right? So we had to figure out how do we keep and sustain this crowd, these subscribers, these engagement? So remember my model I told you? It's the reverse marketing model, which leverages the engagement loop with targeted consumers. Okay? The engagement part of a business model is very, very important. And what we've done is this, the brand, we've embodied the aura brush positioning of the brand with Morgan the aura brush tongue. And every Tuesday, he does Diaries of a Dirty Tongue. 90% of bad breath comes from bacteria on your tongue. So Morgan is this, and it's, it's, we've done 40, 42 videos. We get anywhere from 20 to up to 100,000 views on those stories per week. In addition to that, we get anywhere from 3 to 5,000 comments on the video. People comment on the cinematography of it. They comment on the view of it. J Morgan's always asking a question about you know, certain things and what's going on. And so it's a way for us to keep our consumers engaged. About every once a month, we actually kind of run more of the ore brush guy who's selling. right? He's the sales guy. Morgan, the ore brush tongue, he's kind of the branding, the positioning guy, keeping people engaged. Today, you know this, today you're not going to be advertised to with features and benefits of the product. You know, someone said to me, why is it that that original video was so successful? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, it was funny, and it entertained people. Two, it educated you. You actually did believe suddenly, maybe my bad breath has something to do with my tongue. And thirdly, it happened to be about the right length of, of time. It wasn't too short, too, too, too long. And it, it kind of struck that common, you know, sweet spot, which is not easy to find. So... And the last part, and then I'll tie it up here. This, this, is, this is another part of the fascinating story. So on our site, if you go to our site, you go down here, and we have hundreds, I think it's 175 now, hundreds of user-generated product reviews that, interestingly enough, have been seen also about 3.6 million times. Now think of this model. Think of this, okay? So these guys are coming onto our site. 
And you know, look at, the, look at the length of time on some of these. Five minutes, two minutes, five minutes, seven minutes down there. They're doing a product review. It's rather gross, by the way. They, sh they basically kind of show you it works. And those hundreds of views have been then people click on them like I have before and watch them. So right on our site, we're getting additional exposure and engagement of the consumers, of the, targeting, of the target consumers. OK? So, where else are many people now spending time on their mobile, right? In fact, apps on the Android, apps on the, on the uh, iPhone, proliferation unbelievable, okay? So we have an iPhone app. This thing, by the way, has been downloaded 240,000, 50,000, 250,000 times now. You go on to that, you download the app. It'll show you where the store is that you might get your Aura brush. And then, by the way, we're also looking to the future, which is mobile couponing. Okay? So Aura brush is mobile coupon ready right now for retailers like Target. There's only a few that are actually mobile coupon ready. But in the future, you may be driving by Walgreens. We will be able to geo-target you, zip you, uh, uh, and QR uh, mobile coupon and say, hey, stop into Walgreens and get a buck fifty off your Aura brush. That, by the way, is not, I mean, that, that actually is capable today. There just aren't a whole lot of retailers that are doing it. And we're working with Google on this to, to, to do this. Now, here's the other part. So if you take a look at our reverse marketing model, we basically launched the product with what? YouTube and Facebook. It's just those two. When I met up with Jeff Harmon and Bob Wagstaff, um, they had about 200,000 fans on Facebook. And I was blown away because the business I was running in P&G, I'd paid a, quite a bit of money to some marketing agencies that were helping me. I knew that the social media was going to be a place where you want to pick up your audience uh, for consumer products. And I was so proud of my 13,000 that I had. I actually didn't believe them when I met up with them that they actually had this. 270,000 fans. Now, just for perspective, three rather large brands, Colgate, Oral-B, and Crest White Strips combined are less than 1,000 or less than 100,000. Okay, so again, I knew that they were, they were onto something. Take a look at that demographic. Remember what I told you? So if you really looked at it, you know, we were, we're trying to focus really in these two areas here, these three areas, and we're being pretty successful. Look at the 13 to 17-year-olds, okay? But take a look, by the way, look at the 55 to 54-year-old men. What, what's going on with that? I have to tell you, I'm not sure, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's rebounding off of a marriage or, and worried about, uh, I don't know. It's a it's very interesting uh, demographic, right? Uh, maybe their wives are getting tired of their bad breath after 20 years or so. I don't know, but it's an absolute phenomenon, and, and this is kind of data that you can get from this kind of a marketing model. Now, as I said, with this new marketing model, we are proving ground that Friedman talked about in one of three of his flatteners had to do with the Internet. And it's basically what's been happening. 50,000, this number is probably a little low now, 50,000 people every day are learning about Orbrush. And as I said, we are now going into retailers. Let's share one story with you. Boots in the UK. Why is the Orbrush out of Springville in Boots in the UK? Think of this story as entrepreneurs or as marketers. 30,000 of our 270,000 fans on Facebook are located where? Because the internet is global. They're in the UK. So those consumers were going into Boots and asking for Aura Brush. Think of how many consumers had to go into Aura Brush, into Boots, before someone at Boots called Boots Headquarter, and then someone at Boots Headquarter tracked down and found Bob Wagstaff and Aura Brush in Springville, Utah. 
fascinating story. Do you need to understand global markets? I think so. I think you need to understand how that works. That was our, one of our first retailers. Canada, London Drugs, same thing. Came to us, called us and said, we want to we wanna sell your product. People are coming into our stores asking for it. My 23 years at Procter & Gamble, no one ever called me to ask me for my, for my new product. Okay, So it's quite an interesting story related to that. Now, this next part was about growing the category. I think it's far less important, and I'd love to leave a little bit of time for question and answers. So interesting part of this story. I think we are doing something, by the way, that, that no one else has done. We know that. Uh, if you go onto our website, in fact, it's actually pretty impressive just to, to show you that because for me, it's, uh, I still kind of pinch myself wondering. If you go down here and look at in the news, so this is, this is just a spattering uh, and look at the dates on this. So we have, for about seven months, been incorporating um, un just unbelievable um, press coverage on what's going on. ABC's Nightline, which many of you probably have never seen because it's not your target demographic, but ABC's Nightline, and it's on the website, it has about a nine-minute segment. They flew two film crews out to Provo, Utah, and spent a day in the life of Orbrush. And, uh, and the story is pretty good. I think it captures well. They basically talk about, is this a new way that business can be done? Now, why can't anyone just do what we've done? What is so unique to close this up? What is so unique about what we've done? Why, it, why can't anyone do what we've done? Shoot a funny video, stick it up on YouTube, engage with a few folks on Facebook. It was, it was original. It, wasn't, it doesn't seem like you're copying anybody else. It doesn't feel like, the, the consumer doesn't feel like they're being forced to, to consume this. And so, yeah. I mean, the next guy that follows and does the same thing, like, oh, Aura Brush did it, and they're just copying Aura Brush. Yeah. And that's, I mean, it's just first time. It's a good point, Jeremy, what you're saying. Uh, any other thoughts on this? Why are we successful? What, what is it? Why can't anyone just do this? Why can't you do it? You're entrepreneurs. Might you be able to do it? Why not, right? Why not? Okay. The TechCrunch article is worth reading if you're an entrepreneur. Go, go on the site and read it. It actually outlines, I think, a lot of what is going on in the landscape of social media marketing and tech. So interesting story, again, about Orbrush. Are we a tech company? Are we an internet company? Or are we a consumer product company? You're a tech company. Right. Jeremy thinks we're a tech company. What are we? So by the way, I think we're both. When I invested in the company, I believe that actually we're both. And when I used to tell that to people with a tongue cleaner, they said, what do you mean you're a tech company? Well, if you, if you go on the site, February 14th, we, were, we, we took our first round of Series A funding, $2.5 million, from True Ventures out of Palo Alto, a complete tech company, very, very reputable company, and from 2X Consumer Products Growth Partners out of Chicago which validated, in my opinion, that, it, that we're both, both. And it's, by the way, why some people are watching us and talking about us. Because we're using tech and we're using the medium to actually do what a consumer products group has always done, but we're just doing it in a reverse way. And by the way, so I was talking to Adobe, the, the guy that leads Adobe, and Adobe spends about, I think it was $70 million they spend on marketing. How much do you think Aura Brush has spent on this? Okay, It's about $500,000. $500,000, Adobe isn't even close to those kind of metrics on Facebook or YouTube. So we've had an incredibly efficient way to spend money. And as an entrepreneur, I think it's a great opportunity to do that. Now, let me pause. There, there's, there's just a, kind of a summary I'd like to give. Let me pause. Any questions that you guys might have of me? Either of my big company experience or my small company experience. Are you a publicly traded company? No, we're private right now. Jeremy. Um, so how do you think this will, so you're a, you're a consumer product, but this model um, in the future will be able to use, I mean, what, what do you see the future of it as for like a business to business or like a, a product that targets professionals? Yeah. Here's what I would say about, you know, what I'm learning. I don't care if you're a product, a service, or an institution. Uh, you know, U Utah State U University, I don't care if you're a product, a service, or an institution, if you do not have a strategy for social media for creating awareness about your so service, product, or institution, 
you are missing a significant, very efficient way to spend marketing dollars. So first, you've got to have a presence, okay? Now, I, I call it the four C's. I'll, I'll give you these quickly. I ask, I'm asked in every interview, why are we successful? And we're boiling it down to a couple of things. Four C's. The first one is content. Your content has to be engaging, has to be authentic, has to be um, something that is funny and entertaining, educational. So guess what? 20 years plus I've been working on marketing and content still matters, even on YouTube, even on Facebook. So content is very important. One reason why others can't just do it, you know, I got a call from some of my P&G buddies. They said, who's the agency doing your video work? It's, it's a couple of BYU guys. That's the agency. And the, you know, by the way, they're not Madison Avenue slick, but they also, by the way, go look at, go look at a few of those videos. They're not backyard stuff. So we've kind of striking the balance for what I think works for your generation. Content matters. Second thing, you've got to be consistent. You know, I actually take offense to it when someone, look at a bunch of the articles they write on us and they talk about going viral, okay? I never tried to go viral. We were actually trying to become a $50 million number one tongue cleaning company and following good marketing practices. So the second C, you've got to be consistent. You've got to be able to have the brand show up on the internet, on Facebook, in the newspapers, in the PR work. It's got to sound consistent on where you're going and what you're doing. Diaries of a Dirty Tongue. It's a consistent brand embodiment of what we do. The episodes are funny and engaging, but every single one at the end, look at every single one, and it comes to my third C. Every single one, the third C, is you've got to, be, you've got to have a call for action. In everything we do, uh, Morgan, when he was interviewed by ABC's Nightline, Morgan said, um, he said, you know, we get people, we pick them up on YouTube, they watch us for a couple of minutes, and then they give us a comment saying, hey, dude, really great YouTube video, I just ordered my ore brush. They didn't get it that we just sold them an ore brush, right? There's a call to action, look at it, everywhere. We ask them to prescribe to the channel, prescribe, I use that because that's the funny way, it's actually subscribe, but Morgan calls it prescribe. We ask them to subscribe to the channel. We ask them to become a fan on Facebook. We regularly engage with them on Facebook. We have four to 5,000 comments on our Facebook engagements all the time. Call to action. You can't forget that. And then the last thing is collaboration. I don't know if you noticed, if, if you're a YouTuber, any YouTubers in here? So the guy in the, the interview is a guy named Wheezy Waiter. Okay? I didn't know who Wheezy Waiter was. Go on YouTube. Wheezy Waiter has about 700,000 subscribers. He is actually making hundreds of thousands of dollars. He's just become a platform for entertainment and communication. We partnered. We're collaborating with big YouTubers. We are big enough now that they're getting a pop from us. We're getting a pop from them. We're collaborating with Google. We're collaborating with Google on how to... We're in beta test on three different things for Google. So collaborating and expanding your footprint is also important. So summarizing those four things is kind of what I, what I think we've done. Um, listen, I think your generation has an amazing run to go. And I hope that the story kind of inspired you. I hope it kind of gave you some insights. The game is changing. Friedman, I, when I first heard him speak, the world is flat. I, I was even working international. I, I thought he was probably right. He's right on most of what he said. It's actually happening faster than he said it. So thank you very much. Thank you.